Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. Today, today we talked to Carla Trainer. She is the president of Quilts Beyond Borders, which is this huge volunteer organization that does, makes amazing quilts for, for, for people all over the world. Um, they're at quilt, the Quilt Festival in Houston. Um, they have uh, different chapters. They're incredible. And she is just so much fun. I hope you enjoy this uh, interview. Okay, this is... Uh Elizabeth Townsend Guard, and we are super psyched to be talking to Carla. And we're gonna, <laughs> Carla, I'm gonna ask you who you are in just a second. I know that's super ridiculous, but we'll we'll do it that way because I just said your name. Um, so tell me who you are, Carla, and um, and we, who you, what you're connected with. Hi, I'm Carla Tremer, and I'm the president of Quilt Beyond Borders. So very, which cool. is a charity. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? It's a committee that gives quilts to needy children and orphans throughout the world, wherever the warmth of a quilt is needed at night. Oh, I'm so psyched. And I saw you, I met, I don't know if I met you, but I saw your booth at the Quilt Festival in Houston. That's where I first, oh, excellent. yeah, and that's how I connected to you. Um, and I can't wait to hear about your, your, um, your program. Um, so before we start, let me ask you, what's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? Well, when I was a little girl, I actually grew up in Ethiopia. And most people don't really? think of it as a cool country, but uh-huh. it, actually at night, because Addis Ababa, the capital city, is 8,000 feet above sea level, it gets very cold at night, like it might in Denver. Um, in fact, it, it has sort of San Francisco weather where it tends to be damp and it's that damp cold that goes to your bones. That's the worst. And my grandmother, it yeah. is. It really my is. Grandmother had made, yeah. My grandmother had made twin size quilts for my sister and myself. They were similar colors, but different patterns. And we each had one on our twin size beds. And I, because there's no TV or anything like that there, or there wasn't then, I used to sit on my bed and look at the way the squares came together and the triangles came together. And I think a lot of that helped me to build, to develop my math ability, my sense of color and my love for quilts in general. That's really interesting. So when did you start quilting? I actually made my first quilt for boyfriends when I was right around 21, 22. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, this is back in 1976 or so, Uh and the reality is they were terrible. They were nine-inch squares. I'd never quilted before, so they had five-eighth-inch seams. I made them like big bags. I shoved the batting in. I crawled in to put the batting in the corners. I tied them (laughs) with um, with embroidery floss, Uh and... That's how I made them. And I'm sure that the women that they eventually married long ago gave those to Goodwill or made them into dog beds. <laughs> That's it very was funny. Pretty terrible. That's really pretty funny. terrible. Um, and so when did you, so 76, that's, that's kind of like the renaissance of quilting, right? It all starts to come back. Tell me a little bit about yes. sort of that period of time and, and why, is that part of why you were starting to quilt? Because it was like a thing at that point? Well, I started to quilt because one of my boyfriends had a roommate. Well, it was my college sweetheart. He had a roommate whose girlfriend quilted, and she showed me hers and that she had made for him. And I just thought, oh, how gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make something similar for Steve. And I made something for Steve. It wasn't nearly as gorgeous as hers. And Mm -hmm. she was clearly someone who knew how to do it well. Um, Mine came out okay. but I, after that, I made one other, maybe a year or two later, and then I didn't quilt again till 2001. And I quilted in 2001 because my mother had um, gone into an assisted living place after a transient ischemic attack, and she was very depressed. 
So I wanted to make her something very bright, very colorful, and that had to do with her history. Um, so that she could perhaps have it on her bed and if her door was open, somebody might see it and come in and talk with her. Um, and so what I did was I found some African fabrics and I used a lot of reds and red, yellow, green, which was the, the colors of the Ethiopian flag and some jungle prints. And I made it like a, um, a courthouse steps block. There were you know, maybe 12 of them. And it turned out actually pretty well. I made it with Marty Michelle's book on um, Quilt As You Go. Oh, cool. So the first few years, I, yes, the first few years I quilted, Marty Michelle was like my idol. I bought all her books and I did everything Quilt As You Go. I had always sewn from the time I was, I mean, hand stitching when I was probably six. Um, and then machine garment sewing from the time I was 11 on. I, I used to sew clothes for um, other people for money when I was in high school. I really? made everything from, yes, coats to bikinis and back. Wow, and, you're um, such an entrepreneur. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yes, I, I love doing it. And um, other people could use what I made. So I enjoyed it. That's very cool. Hold on just a sec. I'm at my office and there's a mm -hmm. bunch of noise outside. So I'm going to close my door. So hold on just one second. Okay. All right. I'm back. All right, so that's okay. and so so. How did did your mom like it when you gave it to her? How did she feel? I mean, it feels like you made love for her so that she didn't feel alone when she was in the new place. <laughs> she did like it. It's funny because she had come from a family that really kind of thought that quilts were made by poor people who um, cut up their old clothes to mm -hmm. use for blankets. It was sort of a necessity. Whereas yeah. my father's mother saw it as more of a an art form and a, a way to pass on love. So really they both came from two different, different, you know, quilting backgrounds. Yeah. Um, one that had no quilts <laughs> and the other that, yeah, the other one that really did love quilts. So I took after my paternal grandmother in that side. Um, Interesting. Yeah. It's, I, and I guess I got my first long arm in about 2006. I really? started going to, Yes, I started going to um, major quilt shows because I live not far from Chicago and, and the um, IQF uh -huh. would be there every year. And I started going. And of course, the first year you walk through a show and you say, oh, how wonderful. Oh, I right. could never do that. And you walk right. out almost a little bit blessed. Right. And then the second year, it's like, oh, I could do something like that. Right. You know. Right. And then after while you're looking around at the vendors and the various um, tools and techniques and and I saw the first long arm and it's funny because I had always done a lot of art I I, I was actually a, a businesswoman I, I spent 30 years with IBM and so I wasn't doing a lot of art then but I had always loved it always drawn always sketched and when I walked up to the long arm and started to you know stitch Actually, a few people kind of gathered around me, which was really? kind of strange. That's really awesome. Somebody, <laughs> yeah, I was sort of doing a, a like a Peter Max thing with clouds and stars and stuff like that. And somebody says, "Oh, we should send our tops to her." And wow! I thought, "Oh, I thought people do this for money." Right. That's <laughs> just, really cool. I was just having a great deal of fun with it. So yeah. I thought to myself, "This is about 2003, I think." I said to myself, oh, I think I want one of these, but I was still working. Uh -huh. So I came home and I mentioned it to my husband and he said, well, where would we put it? <laughs> um, He's very are perceptive. You sure you it? <laughs> are you sure you would use it? Right. And um, we kind of had that conversation for you know, every year after the show for a couple of years. And then one year he came home and he was just acting a little odd. And after a while, she said to me, um, I just bought a motorcycle. And I said, well, that's awesome. You know that conversation we've been having about the long arm for three years? 
that conversation is over. <laughs> so, uh, I like that. So I got my, I got my first song on. <laughs> and so loved great. it. I found that right away I did not want to do it as a business. Well, first of all, I was still working for IBM, so I really didn't have time to do it for other people. Yeah. But I loved doing it. Um, I did a couple things for other people, and I didn't like the pressure. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and so I made things that I loved. I quilted things for myself. I made things that I wanted to make for relatives. And, you know, pretty soon we just run out of relatives to quilt for. <laughs> it's really true. It's so true. Yeah. I mean, it's like people yeah. like someone said, are you, are you giving your, um, your family quilts for Christmas? I'm like, yeah, no, I think that'll just be irritated. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> there's enough quilts. Like yeah. stop with the quilts. <laughs> it's true. And, true. and then I overheard a couple of people in Chicago and this was probably 2007 talking about a woman named June Colburn and she, um, Ben's beautiful Asian fabrics and I had taken a class from her and I don't even remember what the class was but I knew who she was and um, someone said that she was starting a charity that gave quilts to children in Ethiopia oh my gosh well, yeah, like you were just like yeah. all over that that's like your background so yeah. right yeah. Absolutely. I, I wrote a note on the back of my business card left it with somebody asked them to give it to her and I don't think it ever got to her so the next year at the show, she had a booth. So I showed up in the booth, introduced myself, and she lit up and said, oh, you can come to Ethiopia with us. You'll have language skills. Oh, my gosh. Now, really, I left Ethiopia at the age of 11. And at that point, I was in my oh, early 50s, uh -huh. <laughs> not having spoken a lot of Amharic, which is the national language to people in yeah, 40 years. Um, <laughs> what did you do? I, yeah, I, I couldn't say I had language skills, but I um, did tell her that I would love to go back and, and that I would um, also love to quilt for her and that I had a long arm. So I picked up, I think, three tops, went home, put them up, bound them, sent them back to her, and I made about four or five more quilts and sent them along with them. And sent a note saying, I really love doing these and I would love to do more. Well, <laughs> you have to be careful what you wish for. Totally. Yes. A week or so later, I walked outside and found a box of 50 quilt tops on my <laughs> <laughs> You totally, oh, that's so funny. You definitely got yes. yourself in deep. That's so funny. Yes. Yes. I did got she, it from her she and she was funny. Marie. What, like, like, did she well, realize what she was doing? Was that, like, a, I don't know. That's a lot to send to one person. Well, I think Moon would have realized it, but she and Noreen Fling were co-founders. Um, Noreen Fling is um, a woman who was not at the time a clother. She is now. But her daughter had been doing volunteer work in Ethiopia and had seen the orphanages and had known how cold it was at night. And so there was a point when she said to her mother, what can we do to help these children? Mm -hmm. And Noreen and June were friends. And it was sort of like, let's give them quilts. Mm -hmm. So the first year, I think they gave about 250 to um, little, little girls in an orphanage that was run by the um, Mother Teresa Order oh, of um, mm -hmm. Yes. And then the second year, they gave, I think, 258 to little boys in the same orphanage. And they had friends help them and anybody they could find to help them and, you know, a, a church guild helped them and so forth. And so that's how they got their first ones. Well, Noreen was the one who sent me the 50. And um, I, I said, to her, well, you know what? I can't do all 50 because I still work for a living, but I will be your long arm coordinator. Interesting. And so I started coordinating, put a few notes onto um, Yahoo groups and said, is anybody interested in doing this? And quilters are such amazing, glorious, generous, wonderful people. Totally. I got, yes, I got notes from all over the U.S. of people who wow. said, send me some. Wow. So at because this point... Bumps. Because it's just, it really, this, you know, I've been doing this project, we've been interviewing for now a number of months, and 
I just, there's just so much love and so much kindness and so much giving that I don't think people, I mean, it's just, it's such a joy to work on this project. And so it doesn't surprise me. So what happens next in the story? So you've got 50 and now they're sending, it's sending out all over the country. Um, what happens next? Well, pretty soon I um, no longer had 50 quilt tops. <laughs> and so I, think I, I got Noreen and some of the people in a quilt guild that she joined to kit them up with backing and binding as I was doing to send them to people as they started to come in to get quilts. And pretty soon we had, I think it was 389 women wow. all over the U.S. who were quilting women. for us. And wow, yes. that's a lot. That's, yeah. I mean, that's huge. So how has the organization you know, grown? Sounds like it, it's just growing, well, growing. Well, it's interesting because I think at the time there were three of us that would kind of consider ourselves, you know, volunteers for the organization. But uh, so many people who helped out and jumped in from, yeah. you know, time to time to make one quilt or five or whatever. Now I think there are, I want to see 17 or 18 of us that are sort of the staff. We are all unpaid. Um, but we are regional coordinators and, uh, you know, a, a board of presidents, vice president, secretary, and two co-treasurers. Um, and we spend our time doing things like gathering quilts, getting them, or quilt tops, getting them out to long armors, um, getting them quilted, arranging um, what we call initiatives to get them to children. Um, the first, I think, until, let's see, until about 2009, it was all Ethiopia. And then the economy was suffering here and people weren't as ready to go to Ethiopia. I had not been back yet, but um, the charity organizations that we worked with weren't sending people over there anymore for that year. And um, the, the earthquake happened in Haiti. And so Noreen called me and said, what would you think about us sending quilts to Haiti? And I said, well, how cold does it get? Well, it gets cold in the mountains there, too. Interesting. You know, it's, it's interesting. Anywhere there's mountains, it tends to get cold at night if you're living in them. Interesting. And Haiti had a lot of children. Wow. Um, so we ended up sending about 200 quilts to Haiti. And it's interesting because some of them went to the mountains and some of them, um, we, we always send things with groups that are going or people that we know that are going because if you just plunk something in the mail, it could go over someplace and be taken by um, unscrupulous customs officials and sold on the black market. Interesting. So we'll work with church groups, we'll work with charity groups, we'll work with educational groups. If somebody's going and they think it's a good idea, then we'll send them with them. Right now we have a group going to um, Guatemala that um, provides fuel-efficient wood-burning stoves, I think, for some of the very poor people there. And they're taking quilts with them for the children and some of the families. So you kind of piggyback on... You piggyback on people that are already going, so you don't have that expense yourselves of going. That you're not, the, in, the, the organization isn't having to expend the money to go because you're sort of piggybacking on other things. Exactly, exactly. Now, in fact, when we go, and I've gone to Ethiopia three times in the last, well, since, since 2012. I usually go every other year, so hopefully I'm going to be able to go this year. Um, but when we go someplace, we do pay our own flight and our own lodging. Um, we will often stay at a charity to keep expenses down, and um, we'll pay our own meals. But um, the charity will pick up a driver for us to, you know, help us get the quilts to the orphanages, and they'll pick up our baggage expense to get the quilts to the orphanages. So, whatever charity you're working with is doing that. Is that what you're saying? Like, if you're working with, is it? Quilts no, I, I'm saying quilt, quilt we ourselves will do that. Got it, got it, got it. Got it. You know, and so where does your – got it. Where does the funding come from for all of this? Because you're mailing stuff and you're doing – I mean, there's got to be some – what kind of expenses do you have and where does the f- funds come from to support that? Almost, almost all of our funds come from our charity booth at the IQF every year. Really? Yep. 
that is amazing. Well, we got to get people to give yeah. you more more money. <laughs> That's really important. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's we, really we important. We do accept donations, and we get quite a few donations every year. Um, some people have um, a monthly donation that they give us uh -huh. um, through PayPal. Other people um, donate, you know, around Christmas time in the name of a, a, you know, a loved one or as a gift to a loved one, they'll donate to us and things like that. So that's really um, wonderful. Um, but I would say probably 80% of our community is in that booth. From Houston. Yes. The booth at mm -hmm. Houston. That's amazing. Well, it's a huge yes. show. I mean, it's got 50,000 people coming. And do you yes. find that people yes. are, are, do you get more volunteers and sort of, is that sort of a, a key component to your your organization as well as when people get to know you like me that sort of stop by? Yes, absolutely. And one of the things, I don't know how much time you spent in the booth, but we do a couple of things. You probably saw that we do sell products from some of the countries we go to. Mm-hmm. Um, we sell, um, some handmade products that are made by the 17 of us, as well as other volunteers that make them and give them to us to sell, to help out the, the charity. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing we do is we give out kits to make tops at the, at the booth. Very cool. Um, we give out probably around, well, the last couple of years we've given around 300 kits. And, um, you know, you think to yourself, well, gee, enough fabric in there to make a top. That's a lot of fabric to give out. Does yeah. it all come back? We talked a lot at some point about should we charge for it. And I know there have been other charities that did. I did the math going back to about 2012 because I track when people send them back to us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they will come back. We provide the fabric for the top. They come back with a back binding. Sometimes um, they've been made into a quilt, so they've got the batting and everything else. And usually within a couple of years, the investment that we've spent in fabric to make the kit, we've more than made up in what's returned to us every year. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, this year, and it's getting better every year. I think um, we were already at 90% of, of our 216 giveaways when we got to, to, I'm sorry, 2016, when we got to 2017, which was unusual. I do send out a, um, an email to everybody that I know hasn't returned one for the last <laughs> yeah. seven years or whatever it is. Uh -huh. every, every year is a couple of months before Houston and, you know, I'll get notes back that say things like, um, I already gave it. And, and sometimes that happens because they sent it to somebody who didn't log it or, yeah. you know, the label got lost or whatever. Um, and we've had a few people who said, I lost it too bad, you know, and yeah. we've had a couple of people who said, I've moved too bad. Take me off your list. And, yeah. you know, and you want to say, okay, you know, but right. you did take something from us. Right. That should have gone to an orphan. Do you not feel bad? <laughs> <laughs> right. Just they just feel a little well, defensive about being naughty yeah. to the orphans. <laughs> well, that's we've it. actually had a couple of people who who lost their kits or whatever and came in and donated money to us to Aww. make up for that's not nice. returning. And and I so appreciate when they do that. So what? What's in the kit, and then where does the fabric come from? The kit is that donated? Or are you guys how? Where's the finances for that part of it? Is that for the money you got in, the year before? In most cases, it is. Um, it started out being from our stash. Uh -huh. You know, everybody's got the, the fabric that they just bought years ago and have nothing to do with. Right. And then over the years, we have gotten a lot of donations from people. So it's normally from what's been donated to us. That's very cool. I mean, and that's just like average I, I people thought, or the industry, like who's donating fabric to you? Well, for a couple of years, I would fly to Houston and attend market and go around and ask every booth mm. if they had anything they could donate to us at the end of the show. We would get um, store samples. That's so We great. would get booth booths. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of the kids came out of those. Um, but, you know, I realized that 
I was paying my way to fly down to Houston and paying for my lodging. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm spending 800 bucks extra to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, between the car and everything else, I can buy a lot of fabric for 800 bucks. (laughs) (laughs) Because it was frankly excruciating to, I mean, you've seen Houston, it's the size of a football field and and picking all of it up and dragging it around. And, you know, it, it just packing up one year it was like 13 boxes of fabric oh we've been gosh. donated and I so appreciated it but it was just excruciating I'm not I'm not 25 I'm, yeah. I'm you know in my 60s now yeah and so you know we stopped doing that simply because there was nobody who lived there who wanted to do it got it interesting um, yeah but um that's that's how we used to get it nowadays i i get notes from people who say you know my my aunt died or you know somebody died or whatever and they have some fabric we'd like to donate the first time that happened i said oh lovely you know and i asked Mm -hmm. where they lived and i said i'd get the closest regional coordinator in touch and they live 20 minutes from me so i said (laughs) okay fine i'll come over and pick it up they said do you have a truck (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> amazing right yeah they had bins that you could put bodies in of fabric wow um you know I, I i am so impressed with the patience of the spouses of our volunteers who put <laughs> up with the fact that half of our storage in our basement is now you know, fabric. <laughs> That's so funny. In most cases. Yeah. I keep saying, I keep saying that I want to do, cause we've been doing, we're at like almost 75 podcast uh, interviews now, but I'm so uh-huh. interested in, in the husbands and the partners and the spouses and the significant others, because um, it's a certain breed that has to deal with us all the time. So I think we need to do podcasts with them because they know how to, you know, they're, there's certain language they know they put up with ridiculous things, you know, like it's just like yeah, there's something yeah. there you know so you know so that's my my latest idea yeah that, that would be fun to, to listen to i think yeah i'd be really uh, curious like if i interviewed your husband what would he say about your hobby <laughs> i don't into. think you would interview my husband <laughs> <laughs> my i think neither. he'd be very grumpy about it but you yeah. know like you know he's He's got hobbies that I don't participate in, too, yeah. so it's one of those things where yeah, think, everybody sort of says, that's the sign, go do. <laughs> totally. And I think in some way, I mean, that is, I think, you know, there are a lot of, it seems like there's a number of types of quilters right now. They're the young ones that have young kids, and it's a way to sort of have, like, you know, the whole while she naps kind of um kind of a genre of quilters. But a lot of them are, you know, close to retirement or retirement, like pre-retirement, 40s, 50s, mostly 50s, 60s, 70s. And it seems like, how do you, like, there's a, there is an element of this, you know, it's the whole Virginia Woolf thing. I say this all the time, a room of one's own. It's like, you know, your quilting space is your own space. And we're at a certain age where it's like, we do a lot for a lot of other people. And somehow quilting's different, for me at least. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about, like, it is a kind of, I don't know, a slight declaration of independence, right? Like, I'm going to go quilt. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, it's true. It is true. It is true. And and for me, it is a, a way to release a lot of the artistic stuff that I didn't deal with for all the years I was working. Um, yeah. I know when I headed off to college, my parents paid for my college, bless their hearts, but they said... Um, we want you to major in something that will, uh, this is back in the day, that will allow you to make a living if your marriage doesn't work out. Ah, <laughs> interesting. That's what, yes, that's what people said to their daughters when they headed off to college in the 70s. Well, and my um, mom, or, my mom yeah. is a 70s, my mom's a 70s feminist, and she always said, have a job where you control the money and you have enough money to be like her whole thing was like, don't be a nurse, be a doctor, which is, I don't know about that part, but she was very much like make your own money, control your own destiny. Like it was like super yes. important to her. Um, exactly. And, and yeah. I guess my parents always felt that we should. My mother was a teacher Interesting. Um, back, you know, back when I went off to college in 72, Ms. Magazine, I think was founded that year. 
now was organized a year or two earlier. So it it was very new as a movement. Yeah. But I remember as a child, and I was under eight at the time, I remember where my mother was standing when she said, well, if I hadn't been a woman, I would have been a scientist. Wow. And, huge, right? um, you know, I, yeah. Huge. Yeah, it is. And, and so when they sent my sister and me off, it was, you know, we want you to do things that will allow you to make money. But back then, it was always assumed you would get married. You would be the second um, salary. Yeah. Um, you, you might make money. You might stay home and have kids. But, you know, you should be able to support yourself if you had to. Yeah. As it turned out, I did not get married until I was practically 38. So it's a very good thing that I took their advice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, right. um, but but it sort of took all the um, kind of creative things off the table. I couldn't yeah. major in drama. I couldn't major in dance. Right. Right. I couldn't major in music. I couldn't major in art. Um, so I majored in communication studies with a minor in political science. Interesting. And I... Yeah, I ended up going to um, get my master's degree in judicial administration, which is taught by a school of law and the school of public administration to become a court administrator. Interesting. And did some consulting in law enforcement and then went to work for IBM. And um, so I always worked and always not in any of the, you know, it's not to say I didn't do creative things in my work. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like in PowerPoint, yeah, yeah, presentations, you know, um, it, which were probably a great help to me in my career because when you can put together a presentation that everybody wants to look at and listen to, yeah, it Huge. helps, you know, yeah, yeah. super, super, but, that's really true. Yeah, but to be able to just create something beautiful like um, a portrait quilt. Or something like that. It's just such a joy to do. It's really interesting. Um, I have a question for you. So I'm kind of like, right now I'm quilting on a, um, a Juki 2010, so a sit-down kind of modified um, like mid-arm thing. But I keep looking at the, mm-hmm. the long arms longingly. One of the questions I have is, do you think like mastering it, being good at free motion quilting, that you really do have to have some sort of artistic element to you? Or do you think it is more of a craft that you can, like, do you have to have, like, when you got there that day and like people just started looking at, like you were like drawing crowds from the beginning. Is that because it's like, that's just who you are? Like it's, it's the medium you have to get used to it. Or do you think that it can be learned? Like you don't have to be artistic. You know what I mean? You don't have to be good at drawing. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I it's, can't quite figure no, out that in terms of long arm. I think it, I think it can be learned um, because I know there are things that I started out not being good at and got better at. Yeah. Um, and I think <laughs> I think having music in the background helps. Really? I yes. I'll and I try think that. it's like yes. I think it's also, I think, and this is something when I was in college, my Swedish teacher said to me, Uh she said, there are things in life that you're too intimidated to really let yourself go and do. And one of those is speaking a second language because you're always a little unsure. So she says, if you go to a party and everyone's speaking Swedish, have a glass of wine and go ahead and speak Swedish. She says, one glass of wine will increase your ability to speak Swedish because it'll take away your inhibition. She says, however, do not have the second glass because that will destroy your ability to speak it. So I I would say, you know, maybe have a a glass or a half, but don't have more than a glass because you don't want to fall through your fingers. Yeah, drunk drunk quilting is not a good situation. (laughs) No, it never is. Never is. Never mm. is. That is great Never advice. Is. So music and a little bit of wine. Uh, that makes me think of the Midnight Quilter. Do you ever watch that show on the cra- the the show from? I think it's on Craftsy. She always has a glass of wine. Which I, makes me laugh. You know. 
Oh, I, I haven't watched it, but it, it, yeah. she sounds like my kind of woman. Totally. Um, the other That's thing great. I found that really helps for um, long arming or, or, you know, or frame quilting is I got a big um, whiteboard that was maybe a foot and a half deep and, and three feet long and get a, um, a marker, a dry erase marker mm -hmm. that is around the same size as the, as the handles are, you know, not a little skinny one. Uh -huh. And then hold it in your fist the way you're going to hold the handle. How and it can be just your right fist. You only need one. Right. And then draw that way because anytime you're going to try something new, I always do it on the, the erase board first because you build your muscle memory. Oh, I love that idea. That's a great idea. Right. Also, when you're when you're sitting in front of the television, even if you don't have your white erase board, you know, get out your notebook and draw feathers or whatever you want to do. Interesting. Just just the practice of it to have it cut as part of yeah. your existence. Interesting. Muscle memory and makes me. Oh, and here's the other thing. Yeah. This is. I think this is part of the reason why I got so many long armors to sign up, and it's it's something that that I learned from Karen McTavish. She said, whenever you want to try something new, put a baby quilt on the frame. Now, quilts beyond borders, our quilts tend to be 42 inches wide and about 60 inches long. Mm -hmm. inches either side are good. Um, so it's about the size of a baby quilt. Uh -huh. And she said, put it on so that where the baby's toes are going to be are at the top where you start. And then go ahead and get started because by the time you reach the top, that's so clever. Of the baby quilt. Right. Where everybody's going to look anyway, you will have mastered the new technique. That's so good. So I always tell people that when I'm trying to get them to um, quilt for me, mm -hmm. and the other thing I always tell them is there are no quilt police in any orphanage I have ever been to. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Every child that gets a quilt is thrilled to get it. Yeah. That's yeah. Really cool. The other thing, and then this is something that Jamie Wallen taught me. If you have a little bit of a tension issue, mm -hmm. when you wash the quilt, that tension is going to get sucked up and it's going to be fine. Oh, that's good to know. That's super I mean, if it's a huge issue where you've got, you know, huge loops or anything right. like that, then it's probably it's still going to be right. a problem. Yeah. But if it's just something where you see pokies or something and you're not thrilled with it, wash the quilt. It's they're, right. they're going to be fine. Love it. So you get long mm -hmm. arm, arm willing to, to quilt for you because it's an opportunity for them to practice their skills in a nice way. Like the, the giving back to charity, right. they're also it's, practicing. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's, it's penalty free and you're doing something wonderful for somebody else. Aww, I love it. I love it. Well, this has been like an insanely delightful hour. It's gone so fast. Um, anything else you want to chat about before we, if, what if somebody wants to, if they're listening, um, cause we are actually going to, we've been recording, but we haven't, we've been kind of shy about getting them actually up and running, but that happens next week. Um, so if someone's listening and they want to connect to you, how do they connect to you? We have a Gmail ID at quiltsbeyondborders.com. And we also have a blog uh, on WordPress. So if they if they Google Quilts Beyond Borders, our blog will come up as one of the oh. items that they Google. Awesome. Um, I do want to tell you one thing before I go. Sure. I mentioned that we were in Ethiopia and yeah. Haiti. Uh -huh. We are now in, I think, about 26 different countries around the globe, including the U.S. Uh -huh. um, in fact, I, I think our most recent giveaway was to um, – <laughs> you know, it, it – People don't think of Florida as getting cold. This winter, everything has been cold. Yeah. But I have also been in Florida. Typically, winter nights can be in the 30s. Interesting. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to be homeless in some place like Chicago or New York. But if you look down in Florida, you'll find that there are, in many of the schools, homeless programs, programs for homeless students. Wow. Um, I'm working with a guild down in Florida called Pelican Peacemakers who um, gives quilts to um, the Volusia County Homeless Students Program. Interesting. And I think there, were a, I think there are about 2,500 homeless students in the area. Wow. This means sometimes, sometimes it's 
sometimes it's kids who have um, aged out of a foster school program, so they're about 18, and in some cases they're living on the streets, or they might be living in a car if they're lucky enough to have one. Um, there are kids that are living with their families in tents and campgrounds and things like that because the family just cannot afford to live in a home. Mm -hmm. And so when Hurricane Irma swept through the state, people who were living in that kind of circumstance often had their circumstance made worse. Terrible. Um, and this year with the winters being so cold here and in Houston and so forth, um, it's, I mean, the winters, the winter nights have been in the 20s and 30s in many nights yeah. this year. Crazy. So a quilt is definitely needed for someone like that. Um, yeah. We've given quilts to um, children, children and youth that were rescued from sex trafficking by the yeah. FBI. Amazing. Um, and that's in the U.S. <laughs> There's a lot of different programs we support in the U.S., we're in 26 countries. Um, we give a lot of quilts to children in Syrian refugee camps in Greece and Jordan and Lebanon. Wow. Um, and, of course, Ethiopia is one that I love and will always try to go back to every two years and, and bring a couple hundred quilts and some friends with me if I can. Um, and so I could grow on five continents, nothing for... Antarctica, because the penguins don't seem to want them. <laughs> and um, we don't have anything in Australia yet. And so I don't really know why that hasn't come up. Maybe the quilters of Australia are taking care of um, people who need quilts in Australia. Interesting. Um, How many quilts do you think you've given away over the years? Do you guys keep track? We do keep track. Um, it is over 10,000 now. I think the last time I counted, it was about 10,400. So, of course, wow. we don't compare to something like a Linus or um, Lutheran World Relief, you who give, you know, half a million every year. Yeah. But um, when you consider that there are 17 people who right. are working at this, you know, right. with it's no amazing. pay, right. <laughs> it's pretty it's amazing. impressive. And, and we, we could not do it without, you know, the – probably two or 3,000 women that help us out or, or who have helped us out over the years to do that. That's very cool. Well, we, I'm amassing a quilting army. That's what I call them. They're like people who join this project to help me. So we should figure out a way to get our quilting army to help because it would be really fun awesome. to have it as our part of our awesome. project. We're trying to experience everything. So we want to experience uh, Quilt Beyond Borders and see uh, how we can help and maybe do a project here that could help you. So um this wonderful is so cool. yeah let's keep chatting this is so great um okay anything else seems like i had another question for um, you. nothing else i can think of but i will send you a copy of our brochure so that you'll have our um our gmail id and our um blog id Fantastic. And I'll let you know when this is up and running. And again, it's Quilt. We've been talking to Carla, who is president of Quilt Beyond Borders, right? And they do yeah. great work. And if you want to get involved, um, we will have contact information. And Carla, can you send me some photos of some of the quilts? And, uh, and um, so we can post it. We'll have a web page um, for you as well that sort of talks about your story. So I would love for you to send us a couple of pictures um, to include. Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll send the brochure and I will link you to the blog so you can pick out the pictures you, you like best. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been such a nice, this is so nice. It's just always, it's just nice. Such a nice hour. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 So this is Elizabeth Townsend Guard. You've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. We want to hear from you. Join our army, our quilting army. Go to our Facebook page. Suggest people to be interviewed. Suggest yourself to be interviewed. We are excited to hear from you. But most importantly, I hope you get a chance to quilt today. <laughs>